Virus cases are surging in China, but authorities opt to suspend vaccinations there. That's as questions rise over the efficacy of Chinese-made vaccines. Short incubation period, rapid transmission, and a high viral load. One expert explains the traits he's most concerned about of the virus variant spreading in a southern Chinese city. A rare clash between students and police strikes multiple Chinese universities. To their surprise, the demonstration proved effective. Apple aims to increase privacy for iPhone users, but not in China. The move marks Apple's latest compromise in order to maintain its services in China. And the White House launches a task force to boost domestic supply chains. The effort to increase U.S. production seeks to make the country more competitive against China. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. China's Guangzhou city is suspending vaccinations for fear of overcrowding sites. But at the same time, authorities there are administering the world's largest citywide virus testing. Questions are rising over the efficacy of Chinese vaccines. Chinese Communist Party or CCP officials in China's latest virus epicenter, Guangzhou, are suspending CCP virus vaccinations. But why? Local authorities said last week that they will shift their focus from vaccinations to virus testing. They say the change aims to reduce infections at overcrowded vaccination sites. But local media reports that the city administered over 18 million virus tests in less than two weeks, leading people to overcrowding testing sites. The abrupt change in vaccine distribution is sparking online discussions in China. Netizens on Chinese social media Weibo are asking local authorities for a more convincing reason. One says stopping vaccinations in order to conduct virus tests sounds like an inadequate explanation. Experts say there will be herd immunity when 70 percent to 90 percent of the population is vaccinated, meaning the disease is unlikely to spread. And that already seems to be a big checkmark for Guangzhou. According to the city's official data, over 70 percent of people aged 18 to 59 are already vaccinated. And in the city's worst-hit district, that figure is more than 80 percent. That's why concerns are rising over Chinese vaccines' effectiveness. A netizen writes on Weibo, I think it's because the current vaccine has no effect on the virus variants. If the vaccine is effective, vaccination should be accelerated in this case. Back in May, local media reported that five Chinese medical experts sent to Vietnam all got infected with the Indian variant. A former Chinese medical worker told Radio Free Asia all of them had been vaccinated in China before going to Vietnam. And in March, the prime minister and the president of Pakistan both tested positive for the CCP virus, despite having received Chinese vaccines. About 90 percent of vaccine doses administered in Chile since February were from China's Sinovac. But virus cases and deaths there rose. Chile is the first country in the world where virus cases didn't drop after vaccinations. Instead, it went the opposite. A virus outbreak in southern China's Guangdong province is getting worse. Authorities have labeled cities like Guangzhou and others in the region as posing a high risk of infection. A strain of the CCP virus, known as the Chinese Communist Party virus, or COVID-19, commonly found in India, is behind the new infections. But expert analysis says this outbreak is different from previous surges. That's according to a report from Chinese media group Caixing. The report quoted the deputy director of Guangzhou's CDC, who explained that this round of the outbreak has shown a short incubation period, rapid transmission, and a high viral load. A top expert from the city's infectious disease center also disclosed another feature of the variant. He pointed out findings from an epidemiological survey showing the infection is able to spread farther through the air than the three-foot distance scientists previously supported. He noted that the virus variant's transmissibility worries him most of all. Research suggests it can transmit for five generations or five different patients without weakening. He called it much worse than the 2020 version. According to Caixing, information on the Guangzhou outbreak's patient zero is still missing, two weeks after the start of the surge. Officials there closed down all local farmers' markets located in the city's mid- and high-risk areas. That's on top of the quarantined and controlled zones. 
What's more, from Monday on, people there will be required to scan their government-issued health QR codes when entering restaurants and healthcare facilities. The codes are part of China's contract tracing system. They indicate whether users have come in contact with a confirmed virus patient. Guangzhou's neighboring city is also taking precautions. Weizhou City authorities recently announced that anyone leaving the area must present a negative test result taken within the last 72 hours. All non-essential gatherings are suspended too. The mandate added that if residents host visitors from high-risk cities, they must report the information upon their guests' arrival. Worrying news from Taiwan for businesses impacted by the global microchip shortage. Local media report a semiconductor factory in Taiwan, King Yuan Electronics, has resumed some operations after a CCP virus outbreak. But it was forced to close one facility over the weekend. Taiwan is critical for global chip production. The company reported 195 virus cases among its more than 7,000 employees. Most of the positive cases were seemingly from foreign workers living in dormitories. About 2,100 foreign workers are now under a 14-day quarantine with pay. Only Taiwanese workers are allowed to enter the production lines at this time. The factory, about 60 miles from the capital Taipei, provides semiconductor testing and packaging services. Two other semiconductor factories nearby are also being impacted by virus outbreaks. Chinese students clashing with police over an official education reform. A student protester tells NTD what it's like on the scene. NTD's Juliet Song has more on that. Chinese authorities have been trying to silence a wave of student protests. Why are you beating him? Why are you beating him? <laughs> Internet users have posted multiple videos, some of them showing police appearing to take violent action against students. <laughs> They're beating him up. The police are beating him up. In one video, the police seem to drag a student away by force. Another video shows a standoff between students and police. And authorities have been broadcasting their warnings to students. You're not allowed to illegally gather, parade and demonstrate. The wave of protests come as authorities push for reform in the education system. In two provinces in southern China, officials tried to downgrade a dozen colleges, funded partially by private donors to vocational schools. As for students there, the change means even though they were guaranteed a bachelor's degree when they enrolled, they won't get one in the end. A student protester tells NTD that many are angered. To protect her identity, we've given her a pseudonym and distorted her voice. We're very upset. It took us so much effort to enter these schools through college exams, but this is what we ended up with, a vocational school diploma. She says the move will impact their career choices down the road. This will have a negative impact on us if we were to apply for grad schools or look for jobs later on. Students at her school have joined protests against the reform, but the police response hasn't been sympathetic. They were very violent. They were pouring water onto us students, and they pushed us onto the ground. A video shows police appearing to arrest a student, pulling him away from the crowd and gripping his hair. Hua says some students suffered light injuries. Some have bruises or their heads are bleeding. The protests seem to be making a difference. Authorities in both provinces have announced they're suspending the reform. But right now, Hua says her school is shut down and notes that no one has been able to reach many of the students there. Juliet Song, NTD News. Eight people are confirmed dead in central China following a coal mining accident last week. The casualties were confirmed Monday. In what's been called an accidental outburst, a gas leak struck the mine Friday in Hebei City inside Henan province. The remains of eight people were found later, having suffocated during the incident.
A day later on Saturday, a similar accident hit another mine, this time in northern China's Heilongjiang province. Fortunately, all workers were found safely and later rescued. Just last month, authorities in Henan province approved the reopening of another mine operated by Hebei City. It had been previously shut down for failing to comply with regulations. Coming up, Apple is introducing a new privacy feature for iPhone users, but not for those in China. The move is the tech giant's latest compromise in order to maintain its services in China. More on that after the break. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. Apple will be increasing privacy for iPhone users, but not for users in China. That's because this new privacy feature will make it harder for third parties to track users' online activities. The move is Apple's latest compromise in order to maintain its services in China. NTD's Don Ma has more. It's Apple meeting halfway with Beijing's mass surveillance authorities. The company is set to release a new privacy feature called Private Relay to iCloud Plus service subscribers, but not to those inside China. The new feature functions similar to that of VPNs. It will be able to conceal a user's online ID, making it harder for third parties to know what the user is doing online. Within a Chinese context, this could mean that users would be able to say anything on the web, including defamatory remarks towards the communist regime, and authorities won't be able to track them down. VPNs also allow users to see restricted online content from other countries. It's unclear if Apple's new feature will be able to do this, but if it can, that means people in China will be able to easily access censored websites like Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Apple says it will not offer the feature in China due to local laws. The company could see a hit in its market there if they offer the feature against Chinese law. Reuters reports that the Chinese market makes up around 15 percent of Apple's earnings. Apple is no stranger to threats of boycotts from China. Last year, while the U.S. was considering banning Chinese messaging app WeChat, the Chinese foreign ministry warned that if China bans WeChat, Chinese people will stop using iPhones and Apple products. Apple is also no stranger to catering to Chinese regulators. The company has been blocking features on its phones for Beijing almost since the very first iPhone. Back in 2008, Apple removed its iTunes music store in China. In 2015, its news app was blocked. In 2016, it removed its iTunes movie store and bookstore. Apple has also pulled hundreds of VPN apps from the Chinese app store. In 2018, more than 80 percent of the company's total app takedowns on the App Store was in China. Don Ma, NTD News. Chinese companies could be said to play a key role in Apple's planned electric car. The tech giant is reportedly talking to Chinese manufacturing firm BYD and Chinese tech firm CATL over battery supplies. That's according to Reuters sources. CATL already supplies Tesla and is the world's biggest maker of electric vehicle batteries. BYD is the number four and also makes its own vehicles. But the iPhone maker has set one tough condition. Sources say Apple is insisting on manufacturing the products in the U.S. That reportedly doesn't appeal to CATL. It's worried about the political tension between the U.S. and Beijing. None of the firms involved would comment, but traders took note. It's not clear what kind of system Apple is talking to the Chinese firms about and whether they will reach any agreement. The Biden administration is launching a task force to tackle supply chain bottlenecks in several key sectors. It's to increase domestic production and make the U.S. more competitive against China. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has more. The U.S. is launching a new task force to fix supply chain problems in certain industries and cut reliance on China. We are launching a new supply chain disruptions task force to tackle near-term bottlenecks um, in the semiconductor, home building and construction, transportation, and agriculture and food industries. The task force aims to boost domestic production in four areas, pharmaceutical, semiconductor, electric car batteries, and critical minerals. 
the Department of Health and Human Services is going to be using its Defense Production Act authority and funding appropriated under the President's American Recovery Plan to invest $60 million in advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing technologies and R&D. The goal is to increase domestic manufacturing and get ahead of crises like the computer chip shortage that has hurt automakers this year. It's also to control shortages of vital goods and cut reliance on competitors like China, including possibly using tariffs on key ingredients. We're also asking the Commerce Department to evaluate a Section 232 action on neodymium magnets, which are essential to motors and a range of defense and industrial applications, to identify tools to reduce our foreign dependency. The United States sources neodymium magnets mostly from China. The U.S. Trade Representative will also lead a task force to target foreign competitors with unfair practices that have eroded supply chains. We also have to push back against unfair trade practices by competitor nations that have hollowed out the U.S. industrial base and undermine our supply chain security. The new task force will be led by the Secretaries of Commerce, Agriculture and Transportation to focus on parts of the economy where there is a mismatch between supply and demand. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. President Biden's getting ready to meet with world leaders, including NATO allies, in the coming days. NATO's leader says the global balance of power is shifting with the rise of China, and allies need to face the challenges together. NTD's Jessica Beatty reports. President Biden discussed China and Russia with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg at the White House Monday in preparation for next week's NATO summit. Stoltenberg says China presents some opportunities for trade, but it's also a major security threat. China will soon have the biggest economy in the world. They already have the, se the second largest defense budget, uh, the biggest navy. They're investing heavily in uh, advanced military capabilities and they don't share our values. He said we can see that in China's suppression of democracy protests in Hong Kong and how it treats minorities. As for Russia, Stoltenberg welcomed Biden's upcoming summit with Vladimir Putin, saying dialogue is not a sign of weakness. We are strong, we are united, and then we can talk to Russia, and we need to talk to Russia, um, partly to strive for a better relationship, but even if we don't believe in a better relationship with Russia, we need to manage a difficult relationship with Russia. Thank you, Janet. And U.S. Thanks, National everybody. Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says Biden's meeting with Putin is a vital part of defending America's interests. There is never any substitute for leader-to-leader -leader engagement, particularly for complex relationships. But with Putin, this is exponentially the case. He has a highly personalized style of decision-making, and so it is important for President Biden to be able to sit down with him face-to-face. -face Ukraine's president has raised concerns about the meeting and about the nearly completed natural gas pipeline for Russia to Germany. It would allow Russia to bypass Ukraine. Sullivan said Biden spoke to Ukraine's president about all of the issues. President Biden was able to tell President Zelensky that he will stand up firmly for Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and its aspirations as we go forward. And he Biden's will... attending the G7 summit this weekend, followed by a trip to visit EU leaders, then NATO allies. He'll meet with Putin at the very end. It'll be Biden's first overseas trip as president. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. A U.S. congressman visited Southern California for an event to commemorate the Tiananmen Massacre. He is also proposing to help Chinese people sue the CCP. Here's NTD's Eileen Eng with more. Congressman Chris Smith represents New Jersey's 4th Congressional District, but over the weekend, he was far from home. Smith was in the middle of the Mojave Desert in California, attending a pro-democracy event to commemorate the Tiananmen Square Massacre in China 32 years ago. He blames the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, for its human rights abuses on the Chinese people. Uh, he commits human rights abuse like few others, the genocide against the Uyghurs, uh, Hong Kong, and the way they have uh, gone after them. The continued persecution of the Falun Gong practitioners, uh, including organ harvesting. Uh, these are outrageous, and it's all coming from the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and that means Xi Jinping is directly responsible and ought to be held accountable for his crimes against humanity. Smith points out that the CCP has grown in power over the years doing business with and often stealing from the U.S. and other countries. 
I believed, and I did it, you know, right after Tiananmen Square, that the world needed to say no trade unless there's significant and substantial progress on human rights issues. Uh, without that, the trading's gone. And unfortunately, the corporations, because they wanted to make a profit quickly and overnight uh, and, and had such a short-term view, uh, turned around and, uh, uh, and, and traded uh, and passed over these technologies that now will come back to haunt us. Smith cited Chinese military tech that closely resembles U.S. versions. He always warned of China exporting censorship and propaganda. Smith emphasizes the importance of Chinese people clearly understanding the CCP's crimes. People need to know that patriotism and, and respect for their country is not respect for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, its goals, its methods especially, especially the use of pervasive torture, uh, is, is antithetical uh, to respect for human life and human rights. Last April, he introduced legislation H.R. 6524, the compensation for the victims of state misrepresentations to the World Health Organization Act of 2020. If enacted, it would waive the Foreign Immunities Act to allow U.S. citizens to sue the CCP in the U.S. courts for monetary damages. He believes that lawsuits against the CCP will help people understand the CCP's criminal nature and provide some relief for victims and families. Smith reintroduced the bill in March this year, but the House of Representatives has not shown any interest in it yet. Eileen Eng, NTD News, California. A Dutch nonprofit says TikTok fails to protect millions of young users' privacy and safety. It filed a lawsuit against the video sharing platform on behalf of 64,000 parents. A Dutch nonprofit this week registered a collective action with a Dutch court on behalf of 64,000 parents from the Netherlands and other EU countries. SOMI alleges TikTok violates children's privacy by collecting data without proper permission. And it does not disclose what the data is used for and where it is stored. Recent reports say users' data is sent to China. With this, the platform breaches European privacy law. TikTok is owned by Chinese tech giant ByteDance and has 700 million users worldwide. Somi also says TikTok fails to protect minors' safety. There have been several deaths globally associated with so-called TikTok challenges. A 10-year-old Italian girl in January died after participating in a choking challenge promoted on the platform. A lawyer working with Somi on the case says the risk of children on TikTok should not be underestimated and the good intentions of TikTok should not be overestimated. It often seems nice and harmless, but TikTok is just a profiling and advertising machine. Parents who join the suit can receive compensation of up to £1,700 for under 13-year-olds. Somi says the total claim amount can reach more than £1.2 billion. Its co-director says it's more than about compensation. In the end, we hope that regulators will take over and force TikTok to change their way of doing it. That's the ultimate purpose. We as a small organisation, we are not really capable of uh, doing TikTok harm. There has to be somebody with an iron fist. So me hopes the suit will make the Irish Data Protection Commissioner take action. They are the regulator responsible for TikTok. So me filed a complaint with the commissioner in April. TikTok says it believes it's not a violation of European law. This is not the first lawsuit against the platform in the UK. Former Children's Commissioner Anne Longfield in April sued TikTok on behalf of 3.5 million children. And the EU Commission gave the platform last week one month to respond to child safety concerns raised by European consumer protection agencies. And that's all for today's China and Focus. But before you go, China and Focus is partnering with the Epoch Times newspaper on their new subscription-based streaming platform, Epoch TV. That's where you can watch our exclusive special reports like this one every Friday night. 
In them, we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website and the Epoch TV website. In our latest special report, we explore how compatible traditional Chinese culture is with Western civilization and question just what's to blame for the clash between China and the free world, Confucius or Karl Marx. Some frame the West's conflict with China as a clash of opposite societies. But what defines the society they're talking about? Is it China's 5,000 years of culture, deeply influenced by Confucianism, Buddhism and Taoism? Or is it the communist ideology that's occupied China for the last 100 years? In our next special report, we explore how compatible traditional Chinese culture is with Western civilization and question just what's to blame for the clash between China and the free world. Confucius or Karl Marx. Be sure to tune in on Epoch TV at 9 p.m. June 4th. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.